Hey, good morning, everyone. Aloha, good morning. Welcome to the Hawaii State Capitol, and welcome to the Hawaii Future Caucus. We're honored to be joined today by U.S. Representative Tulsi Gabbard and Stephen Olakar with the Millennial Action Project. Together with Rep. Aaron Schock, they started a bipartisan Future Caucus at the federal level, and Rep. Fumoto, Councilmember Chang, and myself um, try to do the same here in Hawaii in an effort to engage our emerging leaders here at home. We'll first hear from Tulsi this morning. Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard currently serves in the United States House, representing Hawaii's 2nd District. In 2002, she ran for the Hawaii State Legislature here in this building, and she was the youngest person ever elected. She later also served on the Honolulu City Council, where she was my council member. She's the co-founder and co-chair of the Bipartisan Future Caucus as one of two female combat veterans serving in US Congress. Frankly, I don't think she needs much of an introduction in this room, this crowd. Um, so without further ado, we're going to bring up US Representative Tulsi Gabbard. Aloha, it's good to be home. I hope everyone's having a wonderful morning. Um, before I get started, uh, you know, I, I was trying my very best to convince my colleague and fellow co-chair who started the Future Caucus in Congress to come all the way out here to Hawaii. Uh, he really, 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 truly did want to be here, but uh, was not able to make the logistics work. So we have uh, Congressman Aaron Schock calling in on the line today, and um, he's dialed in. I just want to ask him to say a few words to kick this off. Go ahead, Aaron. Good morning, uh, Congresswoman uh, Gabbard. Good morning, Kelsey. Good morning, everyone. Aloha from uh, Central Illinois, where uh, we have 15 inches of snow and 20-degree uh, <laughs> weather. So I know you're all jealous and, and wish you were here. Uh, with me. But uh, I do wish I could be with you, and eventually uh, I will get out to Hawaii and hopefully uh, can be with all of you and talk about your progress uh, with your future caucus. Uh, as Tulsi mentioned, um, uh, when I got selected to Congress uh, five years ago, uh, I was one of four members under the age of 40 uh, in the entire Congress. And uh, just this January, we swore in uh, 40 members of Congress under the age of 40, 20 of them Republicans and 20 of them Democrats. Um, and got to know uh, your Congresswoman uh, very well and was thoroughly impressed not with, just with what uh, her concerns were with the state of Hawaii, but also uh, her long view perspective of our country and the challenges we face. And we agreed that, um, you know, it's really our generation, the next generation of Americans, who will be living with the effects of uh, these challenges and the degree of inaction, uh, the pain as a result of inaction longer than anyone. And so uh, it's there by which that we came up with the idea of the Future Caucus working with uh, Stephen and his group uh, and some of the outside organizations to really promote it uh, and bring together the younger members of Congress on both sides of the aisle uh, and try and find common ground in these, in these areas that we can work on and try to advance the ball down the court. I want to applaud um, the, uh, the state legislators and the council members that are in the room, particularly uh, my Republican colleagues, uh, and if I were there in Hawaii, I would be urging more to get involved because I know uh, sometimes even if you're in the minority, whether it be on a city council or a state legislator, uh, it, it's easier to obstruct, it's easier to uh, challenge the majority than it is to, to try and find constructive ways uh, and bridges to work together. Uh, but the reality is uh, it really doesn't matter which party controls the entire process. Uh, these problems have been uh, certainly at the federal level facing us for decades. And, um, you know, oftentimes those are excuses for inaction uh, and for people not finding common ground and working together. And uh, as a Republican uh, state rep myself in Illinois, I serve in, in the minority in, in the House and the Senate, have served in the minority in Congress and now in the majority. Uh, and I will tell you that um, oftentimes I was able to get more done in the minority uh, if I were a willing uh, participant with the party in the majority and, and trying to find uh, ways to work together. So um, I know that, that each you know, unit of government has their own challenges. I served on the school board for four years. Obviously, education challenges are different than a city council and, and likewise the state legislature. But um, I think when the elections are over, uh, the prevailing theme I hear from my constituents is uh, they elect us to get a job done. They elect us to find solutions to 
the problems uh, in government that we're elected to. And that's really, I think, the premise of the seizure talk, is that we're not going to look in the back, we're not going to look in the past, we're not going to focus on the last election, we're going to focus on the future, uh, and to think, for, uh, think proactively about how we can confront some of these challenges uh, today and work together in a bipartisan way. And um, I couldn't be more pleased to be working with Tulsi. She's uh, doing an awesome job for all of you in Congress. Uh, you know, I, I know there was a recent poll that, uh, that showed how popular she was, even more popular than Kitten. I think uh, there's, a why, uh, there's a reason why she is so popular. She, she plays well uh, with everybody in Washington, D.C. on both sides of the aisle. Uh, is one of the most thoughtful members that I serve with. And so um, I'm so excited to be working with her. And thank you for sending her as your representative uh, out to Washington, D.C. So with that, uh, congratulations on your kickoff here in the local level uh, in the state of Hawaii. I, I truly wish I were there, trust me, uh, as much as I love Joe. And uh, um, hopefully we'll be with you sometime in the future and know that uh, we'll do anything I can with, uh, with the help of Tulsi to support your efforts there in Hawaii. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron, uh, for joining us. Appreciate it. Let's give him a round of applause. So I think just from that, you can see uh, why I enjoy working with Aaron so much and how we really uh, became very good friends uh, and saw a way forward for us to be able to collaborate and work together. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to be here for a couple of reasons. First of all, to know that Hawaii is the first state uh, to really take this idea of a future caucus and bringing people together to take action and get results uh, is very exciting. Naturally, of course, Hawaii is leading the country. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for, for uh, your leadership and for being here and, and helping to, to move this whole effort forward. Uh, but really, it is, it is about leadership, and it's about servant leadership first and foremost. As you heard Aaron talk about, whether you're in the majority or you're in the minority, it doesn't really matter because the bottom line is that each of us, no matter where we serve or what our position is, we have a responsibility uh, to deliver results for those who entrusted us to work hard to address their challenges in communities across the state. Uh, in, in my district, I have the privilege of serving every island in the state and spent yesterday on Kauai, uh, the day before in Waianae and Nanakuli, the day before in Manai, and tomorrow going to Maui. And with each of these places, uh, people think of Hawaii sometimes as one broad stroke, but we understand in this room how unique each of the challenges are that face these communities very uniquely, as well as how fiercely proud each island is and each of the communities are within these islands. Uh, so the opportunity that we have to bring voice to these very diverse challenges and unique concerns in a way that is civil, in a way that is respectful and constructive, to say, we are on the same team here. We are all fighting for the same people. We're working towards the ultimate same objective of building a stronger Hawaii now and into the future. We have diverse ideas on how we get there, but that's a good thing. That's the beauty of the process that we have, that we can sit around a table and have these discussions and have these thoughtful debates, sometimes heated debates. That's a good thing. Uh, the difference between that and what we've seen happen at different levels of government, what we've seen happen in Washington that's caused a lot of the obstruction that Aaron talked about, is these debates were not happening in a civil fashion. In order for that to happen, there has to be a baseline level of respect, a baseline of sincerity of actually saying, hey, I really do want to work with you. I really am interested in hearing your thoughts, and not just going for the sound bite or going for the easy obstruction line or going for the easy argument to say, I disagree with you, your idea is terrible, without actually offering up a realistic solution, without being constructive and actually being a part of the solution. So this is what we're trying to do with the Future Caucus in Washington. We've gotten a tremendous response nationally, as I hope you, and I assume you will hear uh, as well. And I think from a generational perspective, um, this is where there's an opportunity. Aaron and I, when we started this, we thought, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll go for the under 40 crowd. Um, 
but we all age eventually. <laughs> so, I mean, essentially it's about a mindset. It's about people who are of like mind, who are solution oriented, who are not willing to sit around and wait for things to happen, who have that uh, strong impatience and urgency in saying we have to act now because the problems that we face are too great. And the challenges that we will continue to face, not only tomorrow, not only next year, but for the next few decades, this is where there's the opportunity. We can sit back and say, well, we are where we are, and we're dealing with traffic and aging infrastructure and all kinds of challenges. Or we can say, yes, let's deal with this, but where do we want to see ourselves in 20 years, in 30 years? What kind of state, what kind of country do we want to live in? What kind of country do we want to hand off to the next generation leaders like these kids from Kapa'a High School who are already taking up, uh, stepping up and taking leadership roles in their school and in their community because they're ready. And we have to do our best to set them up for success. Thank you very much. Aloha. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, you know, to echo, I think a lot of us here who also want to follow in the same mold of a bipartisan um, emerging leaders types program. You know, our target audience are folks like um, high schoolers and college students. We have one of our panel members who will come up here, the ASUH president at UH Manoa. Um, you know, I think that folks connect to their peers and when they see folks who look like them, who uh, maybe communicate the same way they do, I think they'll feel more engaged to be active in this building and be active in our state. Uh, next up, we have Stephen Olakara. He's the co-founder and president of the Millennial Action Project, overseeing all strategy, programs, and operations. He previously worked at the World Bank on Energy Projects with, and with pop icon Usher Raymond's Foundation on National Youth Initiative. Stephen spent two years as the first Harry Ott Fellow at Coca-Cola's Environment and Water Team developing public-private water solutions with USAID and various NGOs. Stephen was raised in Wisconsin, um, familiar with the snow as well, I'm guessing. And at the University of Wisconsin, Stephen served as the president of his senior class, which popularly elected him with the highest vote percentage in school history. Stephen Olakar. Aloha. <laughs> wow, I feel uh, my heart is just pounding right now because uh, the leaders you see here and in the audience are making an ambitious dream and vision come true, and I'm just totally overwhelmed right now. This is such an honor, and uh, I want to thank uh, first uh, Representative Ono for that uh, kind introduction, and uh, I want to recognize uh, someone who's really been a great friend and inspiration to me, uh, someone who represents the best in public service, uh, your home state, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, she, is, she, along with Congressman Schock, have been such a positive force in the United States Congress, and uh, they've been pushing this forward. I'm just honored and grateful for the chance to work with them. I also want to thank my parents for coming here from Wisconsin. Although it wasn't a tough sell to get them out here <laughs> in the middle of winter. Uh, on the flight over here, I was sitting next to a native Hawaiian born and raised up on the North Shore, and I asked him if he had any advice for me. And he said, oh, you'll be fine. You look Hawaiian enough. <laughs> so I'll, I'll take that. Uh, I, um, I want to do two things here. One is to say congratulations to the Hawaii Future Caucus for building a wonderful group. I had the chance to meet uh, many of their leaders, and they're just incredible. They, they blow me away with their accomplishments and their dedication to this mission. The, the other thing I want to talk about is the importance of engaging emerging leaders uh, in public life in particular. And there's been a rich tradition in our nation's history of young leaders pushing our country forward, but it's often easy to miss that. When we talk about the great American leaders, we talk about them like they're 80 years old. And a more careful read of history tells a different story. S starting from the founders, most people don't know that the founders in 1776 were mostly under the age of 40. And we need to look at our founders and these great leaders like they were young upstarts, like they were, and they made their impact on the world. 
Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence those famous words, all men were created equal, when he was 32 years old. Then he went and passed a torch to James Madison, who was then the chief architect of our Constitution. He was elected to the Second Continental Congress at the age of 29. So how would that look today? Well, at age 32, Jefferson would be the fourth youngest member of Congress. At 29, James Madison would be the youngest member of Congress. And that tradition continued in American history. Dr. King led the Montgomery bus, bus boycott when he was 24 years old. He delivered I Have a Dream at age 33. When President Kennedy dared our country to put a man on the moon, the average age of mission control in Houston was 26, which means they first heard his call when they were teenagers. I learned a little bit about the history here. Kamehameha, the Great, took the reins of this island when he was in his mid-20s. So the story of this history tells us that young people have been at the center of inventing America and reinventing it as time has gone on. And these examples make me think to myself, what am I willing to do for our country by the age of 32? How are we willing to commit ourselves at these young ages? That's why I'm so inspired by the work of the Hawaii Future Caucus and the Congressional Future Caucus. And the signal that they send to the next generation, that governing in cooperation is a far better approach than constant ideological conflict, that finding success in our common cause is, the, is our politics at its best. Now, as Congress, the Congresswoman mentioned, this is the first state future caucus, the first of many. And this is an emerging national movement for a new generation of leadership. And 10 years from now, we'll be able to look back and see that this movement started in the warmth and sunshine of Hawaii, that the aloha spirit has brought people together. And I think that is special, and everyone here should be proud of that. Uh, I'm going to end with President Kennedy, who said, the energy, the faith, the devotion with which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. Mahalo. Thank you. Stephen. Um, finally, we're going to bring up uh, Representative Beth Fukumoto, Councilmember Stanley Chang, two previous speakers, and the Associated Students of the University of Hawaii, ACUH President Richard Mizuzawa. He's part of our advisory council. Um, you know, in an effort to uh, engage emerging leaders, we also wanted to reach out to folks who work in private, nonprofit, um, and other spheres of life. And uh, we thought that Richard, as president of you know, the students at, at UH Manoa, uh, would be a great representative to do so. So let's get the five of you guys. If you guys can give us a minute to just come up here, bring your chairs. We can all be seated, and we'll just get these mics. We'll next open up for some questions. Um, let's hear a little bit from maybe Beth, Stanley, and Richard, just a little quick. Uh, background about yourself, starting with Beth Stanley and then, then Richard. Okay, my name is Beth Kukumoto. I am a representative from Milwaukee and also the Republican floor leader. Um, I first got interested in this project reading about um, Tulsi's work in DC and talking to Steve at the Millennial Action Project and realizing that, that what they're saying is true. <laughs> we won't be able to move forward as a country and as a state unless we learn to work together, regardless of our disagreements. And I think this is a really good opportunity for us to all take a step out and take a step back from the partisanship that has been going on um, in politics for such a long time and say, OK, what can we agree on? Um, and what can we do to make sure that our futures are brighter um, than what they look like right now? And I think we can really do that if we all just take a step back and decide on what we can, how we can move forward together and in agreement. So uh, thank you to Tulsi uh, for all of your work, uh, because it's been very inspirational to us here. My name is Stanley Chang, and I represent the East Honolulu area from Ala Moana to Hawaii Kai on the city council here. We got anyone from East Side in the audience? All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm 
so pleased to be here with um, Congresswoman Gabbard and Stephen and the folks from the state legislature because one of the biggest problems that I think really turns off a lot of people from government is when you go to, say, your county council member and you say, hey, I have this issue, and then you hear, oh, no, we can't help you, that's a state issue. Or you go to your state legislator and they say, oh, I'm sorry, that's a federal issue. You've got to talk to your guys in D.C. Um, the purpose of this caucus is not just to bring together folks from across the aisle, from the Republicans and the Democrats and from nonpartisan, um, but it's also across the different levels of government, from the local, state, and federal levels of government. Because I think that's what young people are all about. It's about getting things done. It's about working together. We may not all agree all the time, but where there is common ground, let's work together. And um, that's why I'm so um, honored and humbled and proud to be a part of this caucus today with so many great, talented young people. Richard? Well, um, my name is Richard Bizasad, and uh, Rep. Ono has introduced me. I, I'm the current associate student of the University of Hawaii at Manila Senate President, um, which is an undergraduate student government that represents over 14,000 full-time undergraduates at our University of Hawaii at Manila. Um, and just briefly, I also want to thank the co-chairs for also inviting me to serve as an advisory board member to the Future Caucus. Um, before I joined and before ASH also supported the Future Caucus initiative, I had a similar vision as ASH president as a youth member of our state, you know, to increase our youth participation in government, but I just didn't know how. I didn't know what sort of difference, what sort of initiative, what sort of actions I could take as a student, but also as president to really put this forward, put this sort of conversation on the table to get other students, um, our legislators involved. And again, once I found out about this, I thought this is the perfect initiative to both support, but to also learn how to get involved with. So my sort of reasons for being a part of this is the importance of involving our state youth in our government. Also, a huge portion of our state's youth that the Hawaii Future Caucus does target are our own local high school students and university and college students that we serve here in our state. Um, and now is the time to expose them, as well as a, um, share an awareness of civic participation, getting involved with their government, learning what is actually happening down here at the Capitol and down at our city council, and also as well as what's going on on a federal level that they are, need to be aware of, what they need to sort of be starting to get, again, involved with, because in 10, 20, 30 years from now, they're the ones who are going to be our future state leaders. They're the ones who are going to be taking care of us um, once we all get older. And again, those are sort of brief reasons why I'm very humbled and honored to be a part of this as well, to start the conversations and start the important. So thank you. Thanks, Richard. We also have a larger group. Uh, we have Representative Kaniela Ng from South Maui. We have Representative Lauren Chief from the North Shore. We have some members. <laughs> Matsu, I'm sorry. Representative <laughs> Lauren Matsumoto from the North Shore. Uh, we also have some advisory council members. Like I said, we want to involve other folks within walks of life. We have uh, Kaipo Lum is there from Evil Wave. He's an academically trained futurist. And we also have Chris Liu, some of the Chinese JCs, a number of other organizations. And, um, you know, we're always looking for more. So if you're interested, if you're an emerging leader, if you know one, uh, send them our way. And we're happy to uh, uh, more than marry. We have some questions that folks uh, we have some questions that some folks wrote here, but if we have a hand, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Paige Alton, I'm Chief of Staff for Representative G. Ward. Um, Congresswoman, you said that you had initially targeted the under 40 crowd, and as Hawaii has the lowest voter turnout in the United States, have you looked at getting the get the vote with the younger people as part of this initiative, as part of the future caucus being a part of that? Uh, I think indirectly that is uh, an end result that we hope to see come about, of seeing more people engaged uh, from our generation. Uh, and part of it is not only the conversations like the ones that were happening here today, but it is the conversations that are happening on the college campuses, and it's the conversations that are happening on the high school campuses, and really being a, a face and a voice of a different generation. Uh, when I first ran for office here, I was 21 years old, and, and one of the motivators that I had was I didn't see a representation for our generation, for some of the challenges that people were facing, whether it's going through school, young professionals, starting a new business, starting a new family, uh, and needing to make sure that we have that representation of the diversity that exists within our own communities 
here. Uh, so by not only having conversations in this building, but by actually taking things on the road and actively reaching out uh, to folks in, in, at every level is, is a way to spur that. Because as, as we know in politics, you can register people to vote, to vote, you can go to the fairs and have sign up booths and you can do this and that. <laughs> but changing behavior is the harder obstacle. Changing behavior is not only saying, hey, it's time to vote, you gotta remind people to vote. They gotta have that motivation of saying, why does my voice count? Why does my vote actually truly make a difference? And it's that changing of behavior, changing of mindset, of delivering results, and how not a single one of us at this table can do it alone, and the only way we do it is by everybody stepping up and saying, I have to own this, I have a piece of this. Can um, maybe Beth or Stanley, can one of you two address what we're doing here in Hawaii and talk about maybe what we've talked about with Richard as well to engage uh, younger folks to turn out? Sure, one of the projects that we're working on, we're working on a series of um, PSAs, uh, videos just to explain to people the process of the legislature and other parts of government that maybe people don't understand very well and they don't understand that government is actually very accessible if you get involved and if you understand. Um, we're also going to be doing more of these talk story style things, um, town halls where people can see us and interact with us and realize that we're not all that different. We just decided one day, um, like Tulsi said, that, that we needed more young people in government and we needed more people to get involved and hopefully by doing that and by getting out there, um, other people can be inspired by that and they can also get involved. Well, first let me acknowledge Representative Nicole Lowen from Hawaii Island who just re-walked into the room, as well as one of our, also one of our advisory board members, Brittany Amano, who I think holds the record for the youngest person here from Iolani School. Um, speaking of legislation to get younger people an increased voter turnout, you know, we do have the lowest voter turnout in the country, but our adult voter turnout is actually not that bad. What's really, what's far, by far the worst in the country here is the youth voter turnout. And so the, Speaking of getting things done, the Future Caucus has focused its legislative efforts at the council level and at the state level this year on increased voter participation. And I know at the state level, um, a bill has been introduced to allow for automatic voter registration um, anytime you sign up for a driver's license, a state ID, or any type of other government identification. And that's a great method of um, you know, cleaning up the voter rolls, of getting more people engaged. If you're automatically registered, if you don't have to go out of your way, that's something that shows increased and better voter participation. At the county council level, I'm proud to say that as of just yesterday, we had our first legislative victory. We passed a resolution to increase the number of early voting centers. And this was an issue that actually came from um, our friends, including Richard, over at UH. Students these days are very busy. They're attending class, they're working, maybe they're you know, visiting family and friends on other islands. And to expect young people to show up between a certain hour and a certain hour on a certain day, one day every two years, is not an easy thing to do, especially when their addresses are changing and they have all these different time commitments. But if there were an early voting location open for, say, two weeks at the UH campus, and it were convenient for students to show up, and they know they could vote because they, when they got their driver's license, they registered to vote, that would make the, uh, that, would that would greatly lower the barriers to voting in, in Hawaii. And so that resolution passed. So I think we can all be happy. <laughs> Richard, you vote, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you talk to us about what attracted you to uh, the Hawaii Future Caucus? Um, so kind of like how I mentioned before, what attracted me were, was because of the fact that I had a similar vision to what the Future Caucus um, was sort of formed really for to increase youth um, participation in government. Um, I think for me, kind of what um, Rep, or Rep Robert was saying was that it's more than just it's more than just having the awareness, right? It's also changing behavior, changing motivations. And I think that is the hugest thing that we do need to change with our youth and um, our state right now. It's just that lack of, not, not, not that they're not aware, but it's that lack of motivation to want to vote, to want to learn who their representatives and state legislators are. Um, in, my, you know, in my classrooms, who I talk with, 
Um, it's sort of unfortunate that not more students are wanting to get involved. Not more of them are sort of talking about the issues that are affecting them at their local and state and even federal levels. So again, I think in briefly, my reason for joining was to sort of see how I can help and contribute in that way. Um, but in the end, again, it's sort of shifting the youth's mindset um, to be motivated to want to participate because again, um, in 10 or 20 years, they're the ones who are going to be helping to lead our state, whether it be both here at the Capitol, um, within other small businesses, or even in education as well. Okay. We've been talking um, about doing those talk stories at schools or doing maybe mock legislatures or different types of things that would get us into the school uh, because it is always difficult. I've had a couple of schools bring their kids down here to testify on measures, but it's hard to get people here. Um, and it's, it's much better, I think, always for all of us to just be out in the community um, and meet people where they're at. So yes, we have talked a lot about that. Um, if there are opportunities that, that you have that you think that we would be able to get um, into certain schools, that'd be great. Talk to us afterwards. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So, um, hi, I'm Brittany Amada. Um, my Spanish Chinese that I'm a junior at Iolani School. And um, my question is kind of relating to um, the voting process, or the voter turnout for younger adults. So um, a lot of Hawaii best and brightest are leaving Hawaii um, because they feel that there's a lack of opportunity here. So how do you prevent this from happening? I'll say something yeah, sure. quick if you want. Um, this week is National Entrepreneur Week. Uh, I've been here uh, this past week focusing on uh, promoting and highlight the opportunities that are starting to expand here in Hawaii. Uh, I think a lot of people here have been involved with or, or know about Startup Paradise, uh, a venture that seeks to take, um, provide equity capital to local talent to create their startups and to create jobs and create new industries here in Hawaii. Some of them are technology-based, some of them are manufacturing-based, uh, and seeing the opportunity and the talent that exists here in the state and working, as Stanley said, at every level to, to create an environment that's conducive to, to encourage that innovation, to encourage that entrepreneurship, to encourage that uh, energy that people have um, to create opportunity ultimately here in Hawaii and create good jobs is how we can best keep our local talent here uh, or attract them back as people, they go away and go to school somewhere else to make it so that Hawaii is a, a friendly place and an encouraging place uh, here, strategically placed in the middle of the Pacific uh, where there are unique opportunities. Um, we're the only place in the country that can do business with Asia and New York City all in one day's work. And that's a huge promotional opportunity for people in every line of work. Stephen, I have a question for you. If you could talk maybe about your vision behind the future caucus, could you envision it someday going to the state level or seeing uh, both counties and states cooperating? Uh, what was your long-term vision? Sure. The, the answer is yes. As many of you know, the Many of the leaders that you see at the national level started at the state level. And our thinking was, we need to make sure that we engage the next generation of political leaders in our country. And, and it's important to make sure it reaches areas outside of Washington, DC. So the Congressional Future Caucus has uh, allowed a, this message to really uh, penetrate the, the national audience. But really, you know, as many of you know, a lot of the uh, innovative work happens at the local and state levels. So you can imagine going from state to state and engaging these rising young leaders. Just last week, I was in Colorado um, with the young legislators out there. And you know, they remind me a lot of uh, the, uh, the energy that I see in this room. They're pragmatic. They are future-oriented. They are young and vibrant and uh, get me excited about the political process. And I think, uh, as the Congresswoman was mentioning earlier, having those faces is really important. Having you know, spokespeople like yourself uh, leading this, this whole effort makes a difference. And to the question earlier about uh, voter participation, 
you know, young people say, or a lot of people say that young people are sometimes apathetic about the process. Well, young people need people that they believe in, people that they want to vote for. And uh, the leaders that we're seeing here and the ones that we're going to see around the country are, are going to be encouraging young people in, to not only vote, but also maybe run for office someday as well. Any final questions from the crowd? Uh, maybe Travis first. <laughs> Hi, I'm Travis Fallon. I work for Representative Ng, and I uh, had the pleasure of working for Representative Matsumoto before that. Um, Congresswoman, Congresswoman uh, being a Democrat, coming from a mostly Democratic state, you get elected to Congress, fly halfway across the world, you have 434 colleagues, more than half of whom are Republican. Um, Councilman Chang was talking about how the future caucus, it's not just about age, it's about a mindset, and it transcends different, these different variables and, and strata. So my, my question is, from coming from so, someone like you, in, and you look at the speaker of the House, for say the House leadership, he's an older white male from Ohio. Um, within American society, it's kind of difficult to get a different experience be between um, the two of you to put you further apart. So my, my question is, as a member of the Future Caucus, how would you go about bridging that gap, whether it's offering an olive branch or killing with kindness? Where, where do you actually start to make progress? By walking up to them and saying, aloha. <laughs> how are you today? I'm Tulsi Gabbard. I represent the most beautiful district in the state. You start the conversation uh, and don't allow any of the barriers, many of which you just listed, that ultimately uh, are caused by labels, sometimes real, sometimes artificial, that people place on themselves or that other, ple other people place on us as perceived limitations. Uh, ultimately, you go back to, and I, I do look back to my military experience, what's the mission? What are you trying to accomplish? Serving in uniform and serving overseas, you have people from all over the country, of every religion, every ethnicity, every accent, people who like many different kinds of foods, but ultimately, when it comes right down to it, and you're digging that foxhole in the woods together, um, all of that stuff is checked at the door. None of it matters. And ultimately, when you're talking about public service, this is what needs to happen. You don't stand on opposite sides of the room saying, well, I don't look like him and I talk different, so we don't have anything in common. We have the best thing in common because we are there ultimately to serve those who elected us, to work for the people who hired us. And you'd be surprised once you reach out, you, you, you put your hand out, you don't be afraid to take that first step. The response that I've seen in my experience in the short time being in Congress has been incredible. People are very generous, are very taken aback by that kindness and warmth and sincere respect that is displayed. Because even if you may not respect someone's, you may disagree with someone's ideas, or you may think, God, we really do have nothing in common. Ultimately, that person was elected by hundreds of thousands of people in, in Congress, as the example. So at a minimum, you better respect those people and the decision and the choice that they made and listen, because you're not just talking about a person, you're talking about a huge segment of, of our country. And by doing that, you'd be surprised what you learn along the way, and you'd be surprised about what, what can be accomplished just by laying that first brick in building that bridge. Thank you. There's a question in the far back corner. Hi, I'm Maylani Bonifacio. Um, I'm 25, and I know where I want to end up someday. As a senator in the US um, Congress, and my question is, as a young uh, conservative, block you. Um, people I know when I ran for office, I, there were a lot of labels that I had to overcome, specifically at people's doors, um, whether it's you know that you're conservative, that you're a woman, that you're too young. There's a whole long list of reasons for people not to vote for me. Um, and they certainly knew those when I came to the door. But when you're kind, and when you have a plan, and people can see that you have an honest desire to serve them, that's something that's missing. Um, often in politics and people at the door and the average voter can see that. 
Um, so I would say don't get discouraged. Don't let yourself get labeled. Don't label yourself. Um, just get out there and get to know people. Um, and be yourself. And just let your heart for service show through. So if I can um, follow up on that. Actually, I first wanted to follow up on the question for um, Congresswoman Gabbard. I mean, she's, she's very modest. But you know, as a first-term member of Congress in what's been called the least productive Congress in like anyone's lifetime today, <laughs> she passed a bill. I think that I, the Helping Heroes Fly Act, as a freshman member of Congress and the minority and the least productive member of Cong uh, in the mem <laughs> least productive Congress in recent memory, I think that deserves a big round of applause. So she really does. Well. And to Noilani's comment, when I came in uh, and was elected to Congress, I can't tell you how many people said, you know, okay, measure your expectations and don't even try to pass a bill because it's not going to happen. It's impossible. As a new member and as a Democrat and a minority, it's not possible. So these are things that every one of us, including yourself, face. Don't think that you're alone. Um, but it's really, at the end, uh, up to you uh, about what you can impact and how you can make a difference. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I think one thing that unites all of us, even though we may be from different political persuasions or ethnicities or so forth, all of us sitting up here um, who are elected started the exact same way, which is walking the streets and knocking on people's doors. And there's no shortcut. But there's also no... Uh, if you, if you are serious about running for state legislature, for city or county council, um, if you walk on doors, there's, there's no force in the world that can stop you. you know? um, and if you meet the voters face to face, and you just do that day in and day out, as I think all of us have done, you know, nothing else matters, because I think your, your perseverance will really show at the, you know, at the election booth. I mean, you know. Beth Fukumoto won against a very well-known incumbent, so did Takashi Ono. So, you know, Representative Gabbard also you know, defeated one of the best-known you know, figures in Hawaii. Um, and, and that all started because everyone here just started by walking the streets. Thank you. I'll buy you some sunscreen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with that, thank you everyone for coming.